I'm gonna make this as basic as possible. I want you all to imagine, if you want to know what CERN is doing, I want you to imagine you come into a world and you find architecture all over the place, buildings and homes and houses, and you think they're beautiful and it's really a big discovery. You find out with the houses, you can house people, you can do many things with a house, with a structure. All of a sudden, after many years, you become curious and you say, what's holding all this together? And you begin to find not nails that you can take out, but glue that has bonded itself to the materials. And you become interested in that glue that's holding the structure together. And so you're fascinated by this glue and you've tried everything to replicate it. You can't because it's hardened. Glue is hardened. You come to the realization the only way to find out how this glue is working is to break it down to its basic particles. And you have to have that glue in its former state, not the state after it's already hardened, right? So you don't want it in the cured state, the state that you can see. You want it in its initial state, which is a liquid state before it hardens. And so CERN basically is a device that will allow them to examine particles in their initial state, not after everything is bonded together. That's a very simple, simple way to look at what CERN is doing. They're trying to find the glue that holds everything together, is what they're doing. That's the entire, that's the purpose of CERN. As of now, what has come out of CERN is called antimatter, which was first actually produced, it was first produced in 1955, and CERN is a very old organization, but it was produced in 1955, and they found positrons, which are anti-electrons. To understand what antimatter is, I'm going to have to explain the very bare basics of what matter is, and, and believe me, it's going to get very weird here shortly, because you're going to begin to see exactly what they're doing, but you have to understand what you're looking at now. The matter, the matter and antimatter are in fact opposites. Now the matter that we have in front of us, if you take a piece of wood, nothing happens, it's just a piece of wood. But if you set that wood on fire, you have caused a reaction. And then it, it's in a dangerous potential state, it's active. If you have a battery outside of your cell phone, it does nothing. You put the battery inside the cell phone, the electrons begin to flow. The electrons will flow from one place to another. Essentially, that's what electronics are, the control of electrons. They control the direction, the speed of electrons, which okay. create tiny pulses. They flow or don't flow, flow or don't flow. Those are called gates. Those gates form computers. And with a computer, we can do fascinating things. This is why they did, in fact, take Nikola Tesla's findings, because he discovered some things with electrons and protons that were very fascinating. Electricity within itself is a visual observation of electrons and protons in their active state, non-controlled state. Antimatter is the opposite of the matter that we can control. Antimatter cannot be controlled. In fact, when they first produced antimatter, they had to have a facility to contain it because unlike the wood, where you have to have a reaction to cause it to burn antimatter, you have to have a containment to cause it not to burn. That's the only way they can store it with massive facilities to store it. Let me give you an example. In a nuclear bomb, it takes timing, which takes electronics and the explosions have to be just right to cause a reaction. That's a nuclear bomb, like the Hiroshima bomb, which takes pounds of nuclear material to cause it to react. And it has to, has, has to be very precise. Well, let's go the opposite. Let's say we had antimatter, correct? If we had one gram of antimatter, that would equal about 42 or 40, but let's just say 45 kilotons of TNT, which is about four Hiroshima bombs. And it's, it's already inherently unstable. 
It's unstable. The only way to harness antimatter is to contain it. And it takes very large and expensive facilities to contain just one gram of antimatter. Some have failed, some have not. If those containment devices fail, they cause mega quakes. It's what happens when they fail. Now we're talking small, tiny drops of antimatter. I mean, just drops of raw antimatter. It, it's highly unstable. It has to be isolated from the rest of reality when it's contained in a literal sense. Now, given that this can be weaponized, which is true, well, there are other implications that the average person has not thought about. Our body is held together by that glue that they're searching for, that bonds matter together. Those who understand what's called the standard model, they have a pretty good idea of what would happen if the force table in the standard, the, the standard model is just an explanation of how all things work. You're dealing with matter and force, and they have categorized the elements of matter, everything we can touch and feel and observe, in what's called quarks, the building blocks, building blocks, I'm sorry, of protons and nuclei, and leptons, which are essentially, well, that would be like an electron. And then we have force, a force, are lumps of energy that transmit the forces that bring matter to life. But like a photon, it carries the electromagnetic force. Without a photon, we would not have, we would not have uh, any, we couldn't produce motors or anything else. Without gluons, which carry a strong force, neutrons and protons would not be held together. In other words, the universe would not exist. And of course, you have UW and Z particles, which are for weak forces that govern radioactivity. So you have this standard model and they have broken this down, but what they're looking for, what they're looking for is a higher explanation of how everything works. This is the particle they're searching for. Now they found half of it. They already found a component of it. That was the Higgs field. Now the Higgs field is an explanation of, of the, they found the traces of the Higgs field. They can now observe the Higgs field. The Higgs field is what is found wherever matter is not. In your room, the Higgs field is in operation. Listen, with the Higgs field, they can begin to alter reality as we know it. Now, a lot of people may, they can't capture that right away. But you have to remember our world is made up of matter. The antimatter is what we can't see what we can't touch, what we can't feel, though we interact with it every day. A lot of people like to think of antimatter as the other dimension, which is the opposite of this dimension. It's an inconceivable place that is hostile inherently. It's not under control, it's very hostile. This dimension would be the more tamed dimension. Here's what they've done since the 1930s. Well, actually since the 1800s. There was a group that studied nothing but the phenomena of paranormal activity, not like you've seen on TV, not like you've seen in Hollywood, not like anyone knows about. But they studied the science behind paranormal activity and have then defined that this is a dimensional, called a dimensional slit, where things can obviously interact with this world all the time. And they were wondering the interactions between known matter and that type of matter. But they also found with antimatter, this antimatter can be absorbed by any realm of paranormal activity. It is, in effect, neutralized and absorbed. So there's a physical effect to the spiritual world in antimatter. And often, demonic entities and all these other paranormal things are attracted to antimatter. They're attracted to it. When they bring, when every, for every gram of antimatter that's produced and then it's bought into this world, when they produce it, it attracts things from another dimension coming here. What is CERN going to do is to allow humanity to produce pounds of antimatter. What's happening, that is the unseen portion of dark matter. And of course, you have the angels which govern what that realm can and cannot do. It, it's not a 
you know what, it, it's a shame, and I have to continue to say this, it's a shame that the Christian community cannot believe the Bible when it's talking about things like that, because it's going to cause them to be harmed. What they can't, what they fail to adopt from the Bible, what they fail to believe is going to harm them. It, it's going to harm them. They may not be lost in their spirits, but they're certainly going to have lumps all over the place. It's going to harm them. Then I hope people have a general understanding of matter, which we can touch and feel and observe, and antimatter, which we cannot touch, feel, or observe. However, it's working in tandem with the matter, because everything is balanced. The uh, subject of Lucifer in the spiritual sense, because God gives everything balance. Everything has balance. There is dark, there is light, there is good, there is bad. The, everything has balance. I mean, God could have not, why did he put the serpent in the garden in the first place? For balance. God can't give us an honest choice unless we're faced with an equal balance of obedience and disobedience, good and evil. And so Lucifer is used to be that balance of darkness with the light that we're given. And the reason why I see people are going to be harmed when they don't believe these things is because if they do not believe in the spiritual realm of our Lord, well, then they're giving the spirits authority to work in their lives. CERN has yielded so many results and gave a true definition of paranormal activity. It's just, it's beyond me that a lot of people cannot get this through the truth of the word. They, they can't. Antimatter is being pulled out of nowhere, out of this other dimension, which is nowhere but everywhere. In consequence to that, they found out antimatter has a specific type of energy signature that they can, in fact, detect. This is how they, it's part of the process of pulling it out. Well, as it comes to find out, some of the not so good consequences of this process has to do with the human psyche. Stephen Hawking, he understands the implications of what could happen. He understands how it can affect the psyche. For a long time, Stephen Hawking did not believe there was a God. For a long time, he didn't. But you see, something is changing with him. He is beginning to see that everything is so precise, it's impossible for it to be happenstance. I mean, everything down to a trance of a trance of a trance of a trance of a meter is absolutely precise. And he's beginning to change his mind. It's what's happening to him. He's changing his mind. He is now beginning to entertain the idea that what people call divine is in fact done by some sort of architect you have no concept of. Now with the general basis of what CERN is doing, the, the very, that's the basic, basic idea of what they're doing. And, and that's exactly what they're doing with particles. Here comes the other part that's not so good. This is why they have to do another set of, listen, it's not just one experiment they're about to perform. This thing is going to run six months continuously colliding protons near the speed of light to analyze particles, exotic particles that are, made, that are made at the beginning of the Big Bang. That's why they call it the Big Bang machine. It's the only way to observe these particles, which wink in and out of existence in, I mean, a fraction of, of time. A fraction of time. And the consequence of this, of this search to gather more and more of this matter, by the way, they have a more efficient method of pulling out or, or, or gathering antimatter, which is why they need to know the properties of the, some more properties of this particle they have described. Once they have these properties, they will be able to extract as much antimatter as they desire efficiently. It, it's right now to obtain antimatter is very inefficient. It's very inefficient. In, in other words, to get a pound of it would take about 10,000 years at the current rate. It ju it's just not going to work. CERN will allow them to do that probably within a week.
but here's the consequence. They've observed the energy of both matter and antimatter. They found out that antimatter is intimately tied to every single life form on this planet. They found out that energy, energy signature is the same energy signature in all life on this planet. All life, none excluded. Found out when any life form is in the presence of antimatter, the energy of the life form changes. The energy changes. I'll put this in basic terms. A person has both dark and light already in them. It's part of their makeup. It, it's what you can't live in a material world without antimatter. Nothing would exist. And so a person has both good good energy, which would be this realm, this, this realm of matter, but they also have energy of antimatter. So they're connected. A person is connected to both realms at the same time on the energy level. And they don't even know it. They don't know it. And they have found, with certainly, with all the experiments they found, they have found out why paranormal activity exists. They know exactly what it is. They don't want to tell anybody. This is why they perpetuate foolishness on television. But every single person, every single life form is connected to that realm, that, that other realm, into this realm of reality all the time. Now, a person's thoughts, how a person feels, and doctors know about this too, how a person feels will determine which energy they draw from. You can draw from this realm, good realm, and you have positive results. That's called faith. That's why doctors believe in it. That's why they give out placebos. They know that if a person believes something is helping them, they have it within themselves to repair. They can command their bodies to be repaired simply based on belief. And people think they work. And people have recovered from cancer. People have recovered from uh, back injuries. Uh, quadriplegics have been repaired simply by their own faith. This other realm, because that energy is contained in another dimension, so to speak. That's the containment wall. But when a person draws that energy in, it is, it is the opposite of this realm. In this realm, again, we have to light, uh, we have to light a piece of wood with a flame to catch it on fire. In that realm, it's already on fire. You have to contain it to see the wood because it's engulfed in flames. It's the opposite of this realm. When a person changes their emotional state, their energy changes, and they begin to draw their energy from this other dimension, this chaotic and violent and uncontainable place where they draw dark matter from, intimately linked. And it's in operation all the time. Now the scientists, they are aware of this. Now here's the other part that's not so comforting. On the spring equinox, forces change on the earth, and they know this. They know that forces do change, which will in fact allow them to have better results. And uh, believe me, it's timed perfectly. It is timed perfectly. With the basic introduction of what CERN is doing and what it is, and the, the dark matter and matter itself, now we get into the heart of the matter uh, of what's actually what, there will be consequences. It's just that uh, there have been consequences before. Nobody took notice. And the energy of the energy signature of dark matter, which, by the way, resides everywhere. But once you bring it into this realm where we can actually see it and observe it, it attracts things from the other realm. Dark matter is tied to dark matter. Everything has a connection. Everything has a connection. That connection can never be broken by anything. If they bring dark matter into this realm, it's still connected to that realm where the dark matter came from. No matter how far away they put it anywhere, it's still connected. Because that realm is everywhere, and it's still connected. Because it's connected, it effectively increases paranormal activity around where it's contained. And this is why they ship facilities of where they keep, they once kept dark matter in, in a uh, college. I won't name it for the sake of the college.
much, but uh, the, the, or the university, they had to move it to a deep underground facility because of what was happening to the people in the college. People began to have vivid dreams, nightmares, uh, the violence began to erupt and vile things began to happen in those places. And it's because it's a chaotic piece of matter. It is just chaotic. And it's very difficult to, to contain something that is so powerfully chaotic. This is what an explosion is, by the way. When an atom bomb explodes, it releases chaos. Chaos in the form of chemicals, reactions, and everything is out of order. That is the, an explosion is the absence of order. That's what an explosion is. When you contain something, you're giving it order. So it's controlled. Here's the worst part. Understanding that dark matter is always connected to its source which is that realm where the dark matter came from, the realm that's all around us. Just imagine that dark matter being the ocean, right? Imagine this realm being the submarine. We're all in the submarine having fun, and we're, we're doing our thing, and we have disagreements here and disagreements there. And then um, we find out there's a hole in the sub, but the hole is not... We thought the hole was in the sub, but it wasn't in the submarine itself. It was, in fact, in the people. The people's water inside their bodies began to increase based on their emotions. Let's just say that. And the dark matter can then come into this realm through people. That's, in fact, what they discovered in 1950, that people can also produce dark matter by way of, it's very minute, it's very tiny, but it's measurable. It's quantifiable. In fact, they now know how much energy a person has to have before they go absolutely berserk. They also know how much uh, of that energy signature a person must have before an entity from that realm can possess them, which also allowed them to understand that not everybody can be possessed. Not everybody can be, but they're, 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 the person has to be prepared to be possessed, they have to be, in, in essence, they have to be a portal themselves to be possessed. Not everybody can be possessed. And so, not, not to get way off target, but this dark matter is everywhere. That is, that you know what, all these things, here's what, I mean, it really, it really gets to me, is that these scientists, over the course of many years, have quantified or they have calculated these things. They have extracted the truth, the facts, yet the Christians don't believe it. And these crooked people in certain places have already been harnessing this power for themselves, and it's been effective every single step of the way. Yet the Christian community, for some reason, has a mental block on certain things of God as though they have all the time in the world you know, you know, I will say this, and then I'll get back to CERN, that if a person trusts their father, they don't need the father to explain everything. They just need the father. They just need to know that the father said it, and they'll go do it. If, if you tell a child, go, you, know, you, you need to go rake the yard, a child's not going to sit there and say, well, what brings you to that conclusion? A child's not going to do that. You'll just go out there and rake the yard. Over time, you'll find out why, but you have already performed what the Father said. and But in the Christian community, we have to know why everything is before we do anything. In the scientific community, they see the facts. They know they don't understand it fully. And so they have experiments and they learn along the way. In fact, they're obedient to their own disciplines and we're not obedient to our own disciplines. So the problems about CERN, I know everybody's waiting on this. What could potentially happen from this? Well, they had another discovery that dark matter causes other pieces of dark matter that they have contained to, to react. In other words, if you have a container, say you had a, a, a teaspoon of dark matter, and in, in, let's just say you had it in Pennsylvania, and somebody else had that same uh, a teaspoon of dark matter in California, then as soon as the teaspoon of dark matter is exposed to the elements 
in Pennsylvania, it causes the dark matter in California to begin to activate. In other words, you lose containment in one place, containment in another place is going to be lost. It's going to be lost. So they're intimately tied together. Now we've covered the fact that people have the signatures of the energy of dark matter in them and matter. So they contain both matter and antimatter in a sense, the signature of energy. They're not put together. It's just that signature. And we draw upon those based upon our thoughts and what's in our minds and what's in our hearts in a sense. With CERN, as they begin to collide these protons, dark matter is going to be produced in great numbers. I mean, in greater and greater numbers. Not only the matter, but the energy signature is going to also be released into this realm. You know what that's going to cause? It's going to cause the dark energy signature within people to begin to activate more and more. You see, it's going to become difficult for people to stay contained or controlled. In essence, they're going to become violent. They're going to become, they're going to have vivid dreams. The darkness within a person is absolutely going to begin to surface. And it's, this is not uh, theoretical. This is not uh, uh, some theory somebody thought of. This is absolutely 100% quantifiable, and it's happened before. It's going to happen in greater numbers this time. It's going to, it will take effect. That's also been weaponized. Nobody knows this, and I, I probably won't be in trouble for this, but they have a weapon concerning dark matter that they can put within a country or a specific place to cause chaos. It's a weapon. They've used it before. They can unleash this, and it can cause chaos anywhere they want chaos to be rampant. Also, there's something very important about that. There, I know this firsthand. There are often times you have to partake in the weapons development program, and you become a, a rat, so to speak, in a maze, to see firsthand what the effects are going to be. I'll describe something. People can believe it or not, but sooner or later, they're going to experience it, too. I am a Christian. I know that Jesus died on the cross for the remissions of sins, and now sits at the right hand of the Father, soon to be sent to us again. I rely on the blood of the Lamb. I am, you know, as a soldier, I count my Lord and Savior as my commander. And so I am used to taking orders and to operate life or death in those orders that he gave. That's the only thing that saved my life one day. I was thrust into a position where I had to absolutely 100% fight to keep my flesh under full subjection. I could not believe the intensity of what was happening. My thoughts were all over the place. It, it, it was almost like every evil thing that was in me came to the surface with a snap of a finger. Irritation, aggravation, anxiety, fear, uh, just anger, hatred, all sorts of things in the snap of a finger. The only thing that kept me still, the challenge was to be still. The only thing that kept me still, I had to absolutely 100% focus on the Lord. I had to focus on him. It's the only way to overcome that is to focus on him and place the flesh under subjection. If a person's out there and they say, well, I have no power to control myself. Yes, you do. You don't want to control yourself. Believe me, that power is within you, is given through the Holy Spirit. I felt the power, the protective power, the blood of the Lamb and the Holy Spirit during that test. I was amazed. I didn't know this could be harnessed in that way. I did not know, but it happened. And this was a weapon. This was a mild weapon. And you have to cling, people have to cling to the Word of God and His promises. Most importantly, his instruction. You know, not one time when I was in that test, I didn't think about his promises. I thought about his love. That's what I thought about. And when I began to think about his love, something happened within me. Everything came under subjection as though it took no effect. That's what happened. 
they found the force that holds the dark energy or the dark matter away from this realm. They call it the wall. There's another name for that. A name of which that, that those particles they're going to find, they found part of They're going to find the other pieces that are in that wall. And when they find the other pieces to this wall, they will then be able to undo that wall. There's another name for that wall, the veil. Call it the veil. It holds back that realm. They found out what's holding back the dark energy from, because it would be absolutely destructive if the two met. But they found out, now with this as a weapon, there is no counter weapon to this. China is building an LHC facility. They're building a particle accelerator. There are, to present day count, about uh, 14 particle accelerators in existence. 14, not just one. All the countries are vested in the CERN facility. Every single last country. In the United States, we have three facilities here. Three. I, I can't tell you where they are. One is, one, they began to build, but they couldn't, but they went ahead and built it anyway. It's in one of the biggest states in the United States, and it's there and it's operational. It's also going to be powered up during this time. I'm saying this because when this thing does power up, the immediate effects are not what I'm worried about. That's not my concern. The psychological effects on people is going to become quite evident. And I know that people will come under some strange attacks some strange occurrences and incidents. I know that the only way they can be protected from such things is their unqualified belief in our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. You can't fake it. There is no substitute. People know if a person is real or not because they emit a different energy. That energy is that wall that the, this other realm cannot breach. It can't breach it. And they're, they're, it's absolutely going to take effect. The, the collider, it, it, think of a collider as a um, hundreds of nuclear explosions taking place within one second and they're containing it. It goes beyond fusion. It's in a realm by itself when they collide protons. They are going to find these particles and within months, they're gonna put into motion what we talked about today and people are going to feel these effects. And then this other realm is going to begin to spill over in multiple places everywhere. Violence will increase. The, the crucial side of this is that uh, with this show coming up, people are going to realize all too painfully uh, what we've talked about today, but they have to start now. They, they really have to. They can't make excuses for their flesh anymore. They cannot make excuses for their emotional state anymore. They're going to, if they, if they love the Lord, if they truly want to be with him, if they can recognize his love for them, they're going to have to fight for it today. They're going to have to fight for it every single moment. They're going to have to keep this negative energy away from them. They're going to have to immerse themselves in the truth of our Lord. That's the only way they're going to be able to survive. You know, in this time that's coming, which is coming quickly, I mean, like within weeks, people are going to be thrust into, they're, they're going to have ideas and things that they didn't think they had. Now, some people may say, well, you know, all my thoughts are my own. Then why would God say, take, take captive your thoughts? Would he say that? Why would he say, die to your flesh daily? Why would he say the flesh and the spirit war continuously? Why are those things said? Because we have the power to overcome our own flesh because the darkness in this world is about to be pulled out of everything. Everything with darkness in it, that darkness is about to surface in a way that no one ever forecasted or thought possible, but it's absolutely going to take place. And the only way a person can overcome this is through the true power of the Holy Spirit and to stay within the blood of the Lamb. There is no hypocrisy in purity. There is no hatred in purity. There is no accusation in purity. And people need to be in that purity in truth, not acting like they're in the purity.
they have to be there. It has to be in their hearts. And they have to do everything they can do to get a heart transplant right now so they can be strong enough to endure because we all have to finish this race. None of us knows when we're absolutely going, but I, I, for one, intend to finish this race, and I'm trying to sound an alarm that something very different is going to be uh, all too evident to everybody who believes in our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. On the 10th of September, 2008, the largest, most complex, and most expensive machine ever devised by man was turned on. The Large Hadron Collider, or LHC, is a 17-mile-long ring of superconducting electromagnets buried approximately 300 feet beneath the ground near the city of Geneva on the Franco-Swiss border. Chilled to temperatures colder than the void of outer space and generating a magnetic field more than 100,000 times that of the Earth's, this machine accelerates proton particle beams to a velocity just under the speed of light and then smashes them together in particle detector chambers in order to break apart the nuclei and unloose the subatomic secrets of matter. At full power, the LHC produces roughly 600 million collisions per second, creating fleeting, minuscule atomic explosions up to a million times hotter than the interior of the sun. The data collected from these collisions is processed by the worldwide LHC computing grid, one of the most extensive and powerful computing grids on the planet. The grid, as it is known, builds on the technology of the World Wide Web, which was invented at CERN in 1989. The Large Hadron Collider is the primary research instrument of the European Organization for Nuclear Research, otherwise known as CERN. After the devastating detonations of Fat Man and Little Boy over Nagasaki and Hiroshima at the end of World War II, mankind was irrevocably thrust into the atomic age. In accordance with the inevitability thesis, which posits that once a technology is introduced into society, what follows is the inevitable development of that technology. The scientific community, impelled by military interests around the globe, became obsessed with the idea of harnessing the power of the mighty atom and unraveling the very fabric of physical reality at the subatomic level. CERN is the largest scientific consortium in the world, involving thousands of top physicists from 21 member states, all working in tandem to discover the fundamental elements that hold the universe together. While this admitted objective of CERN seems innocent enough, and even laudable in a sense, there are deep concerns about potential unintended consequences and probable occult intentions. When analyzing a scientific endeavor as costly and ambitious as CERN, it is essential that we have a realistic understanding of the mechanisms and machinations that have been propelling technological advancement in the modern era. In a perfect world, the greatest accomplishments of science would be the product of goodwill toward men and the desire for peace and prosperity. However, in the practical world, the world in which we live, the greatest accomplishments of modern science are often facilitated and funded by men who have anything but goodwill and peace on their minds. In many cases, the most groundbreaking technological advancements, such as in the case of jet propulsion, rocket science, and nuclear fission, have been intentionally directed by incredibly malevolent individuals for dark and dangerous purposes. Scientists are rarely the evil villains scheming sinister plots in secret laboratories that Hollywood has often portrayed, with a few glaring exceptions, of course, and are usually zealously dedicated to their particular field of study with noble or benign intentions at heart. However, this kind of religious commitment to science can engender blind apathy, if not willful ignorance, concerning the overarching implications and ill intentions of the benefactors facilitating their work.
This is certainly the case of the brilliant men and women working at CERN, most of whom naively believe that the prime objective of their research is to merely understand what the universe is made of and how it all started at the Big Bang. Unfortunately, what they fail to realize, apart from the fact that they are working from a false premise to begin with, is that their research is very likely being used to advance a hidden agenda, the conspirators of which are well aware of who created the universe and are absolutely intent on making war with him and enthroning another in his place. CERN is an acronym derived from the French rendition of the designation European Council for Nuclear Research, which was a provisional council organized in the early 1950s with critical backing from the United Nations, whose task was to plan for the construction of a multinational European research facility that would be dedicated to the study and advancement of nuclear physics. On the 29th of September 1954, the Provisional Council was dissolved and the European Organization for Nuclear Research, or CERN, was born. As an interesting side note, the infamous Bilderberg Group was also conceived that same year, exactly four months later, on the 29th of May. Both of these organizations enjoy diplomatic immunity. Although the Provisional Council had been dissolved, Paradoxically, the acronym of CERN remained, even though it did not correspond to the title of the new organization. It was distinguished physicist and one of the key pioneers of quantum mechanics, Werner Karl Heisenberg, who had inexplicably insisted that the original acronym of CERN remain in effect, as Tom Horn elucidates in his book, On the Path of the Immortals. Werner Heisenberg understood quite well what quantum physics implied for humanity. Inherent within this theoretical realm, populated by obtuse equations and pipe-smoking scientists, lies what I call the Babylon potential. This is the secret knowledge, the scientific imperative, informed and driven by spiritual advisors, that the Bible cites as the key to opening a gateway for the gods. It is Ente Menachi, Baba Alu, the opening of the Abzu, the doorway to hell. Tom goes on to explain that, although Heisenberg may or may not have known it, CERN is an abbreviated title for an ancient Celtic deity called Cernunos. Cernunos, whose name means horned one, is thought to be the god of death and rebirth and the lord of the underworld. He is often depicted with rings or torques around his stag-like horns or in his hands, which may symbolize the circle of destruction and restoration that he represents. To further concretize this idea, Sir Nunos is also depicted with a ring in one hand and a snake in the other. Because of the cycle by which it sheds its skin, the snake has ever been a mystical motif of death and rebirth, destruction, and restoration. In a reversed esoteric adaptation, the rings of the Large Hadron Collider could be representative of the rings of Cernunos, and, by further associative interpretation, may very well reveal CERN's prime esoteric objective. I believe it does, and we'll address it at the end of this analysis. I understand that drawing correlations between the acronym of CERN and deities from the ancient world may seem too forced and tenuous for critical minds, and I might be inclined to agree, if CERN had not evoked such correlations first. Rather than distance themselves from associations with arcane pagan deities, the directors of CERN welcomed and even celebrated the placement of a very unscientific icon in the courtyard of their main facilities. On the 18th of June, 2004, a two-meter-high statue, bequeathed by the representatives of India's Department of Atomic Energy, was ceremoniously unveiled at CERN. It was a statue of the Hindu god Shiva engaged in the Nataraja, the cosmic dance of destruction. 
Shiva is one of three members of the Trimurti, the Hindu trinity, in which the cosmic functions of creation, preservation, and destruction are personified in the forms of Brahma the creator, Vishnu the preserver, and Shiva the destroyer, who is also known as the transformer. It is important to understand that in Hindu mythology, Lord Shiva destroys the world in order to renew, restore, and reconstitute it. A commemorative plaque positioned next to the likeness of the dancing Shiva emblazons a quote from Austrian-born American physicist Fritjof Capra. It reads, in part, Hundreds of years ago, Indian artists created visual images of dancing Shivas in a beautiful series of bronzes. In our time, physicists have used the most advanced technology to portray the patterns of the cosmic dance. The metaphor of the cosmic dance thus unifies ancient mythology, religious art, and modern physics. Think about this, says Steve Quayle in his book True Legends. A symbolic statue of what might be a fallen angel who promises to destroy things as we know them now and rebuild a new, improved universe with a plaque basically saying the facility will be trying to unify mythology, religion, and physics. Skeptics will be quick to point out that the unifying of ancient mythology, religious art, and modern physics is only metaphorically represented in the dance of Sheba and has no practical application in the scientific activities of CERN. Again, I might be inclined to agree, except for the fact that CERN has been deliberately encouraging the coalescence of mythology, art, and physics in very bizarre ways. In 2014, a dance opera entitled Symmetry was performed and filmed at the CERN facilities, including inside of the Large Hadron Collider. Directed by filmmaker Ruben Van Leer and featuring the voice of American soprano Claren McFadden, Symmetry was a collaborative project involving not only choreographers and dancers from the production team, but many of CERN's own scientists. Once again, rather than distance themselves from arcane and mythological associations, the scientists at CERN embraced this highly esoteric and occult-laced production. breaking down all of the deliberate esoteric insinuations in the trailer for the film alone. But in the interest of time, let me just point out one of the more obvious details. The name of the film's protagonist is Lucas, which also happens to be the actual name of the Slovakian dancer and choreographer who plays him. Without plunging too deeply into etymological roots, the name Lucas means bringer of light, and is in fact a derivation of the Latin term Lucifer. Of course, all of this could be purely coincidental, but given the overtly esoteric nature of the film, it is highly unlikely that the name of the main character is a consequence of happenstance, regardless of the filmmaker's intention. The truth is that the occult, art, and science have always been fundamentally entwined, the natural synthesis or symmetry that binds them is perhaps best illustrated in one man, Sir Francis Bacon. 
Bacon, who is widely considered to be the father of modern science and the primary proponent of the scientific method, which is the very underpinning of CERN, was himself an occultist, artist, and scientist. In fact, there is reason to believe that Francis Bacon is the true face behind the dubious mask of William Shakespeare. There is, in truth, no incongruity between the material and the metaphysical world, the physical and the spiritual. They are merely two sides of the same coin, both essential parts of the whole. When one penetrates deeply enough into what we call physics, one discovers, inevitably, the veil that separates these two realities. Occultists have always been aware of this fact. Even to Francis Bacon and his scientific contemporaries, many of whom were members of the mystery schools, deciphering the mechanisms of the material world was but the means to a far more important objective, to make contact with the entities lurking on the other side of the veil. This veil is often described as a dimensional doorway that allows access into realms beyond the perceivable world. The concept of unperceivable dimensions existing essentially in the same space we physically occupy is not only very probable, but also very widely accepted in the scientific community. Many top physicists are quietly hoping that the proton collisions happening at the Large Hadron Collider will puncture the fabric of our four-dimensional confine and allow us to peek through the keyhole, as it were, into another dimension or alternate universe. Some physicists have not been so quiet about this very real possibility. During a press briefing in 2009, Sergio Bertolucci, Director for Research and Scientific Computing at CERN, made the following curious statement. The Large Hadron Collider could open a doorway to an extra dimension, and out of this door might come something, or we might send something through it. There is no question that the scientists working at CERN hope to open a dimensional doorway. The real question is, what is the something that might come through when they do? Of course, for the particle physicist, the answer is simple. They hope to discover new particles that might exist on alternate dimensional planes. There is no doubt that this is the true and honest intention of the vast majority of physicists working at CERN. The problem is, as previously illustrated, that scientists, despite their best intentions, have always been little more than expendable tools in the hands of their benefactors. The pinnacle of science for its elite occult practitioners is not discovery, but contact. There are many indications that the power players of our world, including the Vatican, are preparing to make contact with the gods of the old world. Although I have not been able to confirm the validity of the following pictures, it appears that transparent panels containing arcane texts were photographed inside the CERN facilities by a group of Portuguese students from the Santa Cecilia Music Academy. The texts have been described as greetings or invocations written in ancient languages, including Aramaic, Hebrew, Mandarin, and Sanskrit. In the case of Sanskrit, the only people with the ability to read this sacred script considered to be the language of the gods are the scholars of the Vedas and Upanishads. If authentic, these panels may have been prepared for those somethings that might come through the dimensional doorway. It may seem to those unfamiliar with the theoretical realm populated by obtuse equations and pipe-smoking scientists, as Horn aptly puts it, that this analysis is nothing more than hearsay, hyperbole, and wild speculation. But as any theoretical physicist worth his salt will admit, particle physics and quantum mechanics is a world in which fact and fantasy are at times 
indistinguishable. When it comes to CERN and its Large Hadron Collider, there is no shortage of theoretical doomsday scenarios, many of which have not been propounded by unlearned laymen such as myself, but by some of the most esteemed scientific minds in the world. The following is a brief list of the theoretical possibilities relating to the activities of CERN, and is by no means exhaustive. Each one of these points represents either a scientific reality or a hypothetical possibility based on incredibly complex concepts and mathematical formulas that I won't even attempt to explain or pretend to understand. Black holes. Perhaps the greatest fear among theoretical physicists concerning the LHC is that it might create uncontainable miniature black holes that could descend to the core of the planet and literally devour it from within. It is important to note that black holes are only theoretical constructs and have never been proven to exist. Black holes were first discovered as purely mathematical solutions of Einstein's field equations and are not necessary in Tesla's electric universe model. To date, black holes are science fiction. Number two, antimatter weapons. Unlike black holes, antimatter is not theoretical. Not only can it be measured, but it is already being created and contained in the LHC, though in very small quantities for short periods of time, according to CERN. Antimatter has enormous explosive potential. A quarter gram of antimatter can produce an explosive yield equivalent to five kilotons of TNT. If CERN develops the capability to create and store significant amounts of antimatter, and some claim it already has, then highly destructive antimatter weapons will be developed. The advantages of antimatter bombs, for example, are very great, and that they could produce atomic level explosions without residual nuclear fallout. Number three, particle beam weapons. A directed beam of high-energy subatomic particles moving at extreme velocity, such as the ones produced in the LHC, is capable of obliterating matter at the molecular level. Particle beam weapons are already on the battlefield, especially in black ops warfare, and the research of CERN will certainly expand and refine their military application. Number four, time distortion and stargates. It has been suggested that by colliding heavier subatomic particles, such as lead ions, which CERN will soon be doing, space and time could be distorted, creating what Einstein called a Rosenbridge or Stargate, which is basically a wormhole between two different locations, dimensions, or periods of time. It has also been suggested that such distortions in the space-time continuum could lead to what has been referred to as the Groundhog Day effect, in which time folds back on itself, allowing manipulation of the past. Number five, DNA sequencing and artificial synthesis. Since it is a fact that the Synchrotron Collider at Berkeley and Walnut Creek, California, was used to help sequence human DNA for the Human Genome Project. It is certainly feasible that the Large Hadron Collider could also be employed in a similar way, but with much more precise results. There is evidence to suggest that artificial human or human hybrid genomes have already been synthesized at Collider facilities, including CERN. Number six, strangelets. Produced from a quark-gluon plasma soup, sometimes generated after high-energy particle collisions, strangelets are the most explosive substance in the known universe, and according to theoretical physicists, were responsible for the explosion at the so-called Big Bang. Contrary to popular belief, 
Strangelets are not theoretical, but have been confirmed to exist at the Brookhaven National Laboratory located on Long Island, New York, where physicists working with the Relativistic Heavy Ion Collider, or RHIC, are attempting not only to produce strangelets, but to contain them. The potential gains of this endeavor for the military-industrial complex are self-evident. Because the LHC is a much higher energy collider than the RHIC, strangelet production and containment is even more feasible at CERN. In light of this information, it should give everyone watching this analysis pause when confronted with the fact that China is even now preparing to construct a super collider twice the size of the one at CERN. There can be no doubt that in the best case scenario, the world is about to witness the most dangerous and potentially deadliest arms race in human history. However, there is something percolating in occult shadows behind the scenes that is even more disturbing than a super collider arms race. When the sum of possibilities is considered, what we have at CERN, ultimately, is the potential to develop weapons for waging war with enemies far more powerful than mere human beings. This is the Babylon potential to which Tom Horn refers, the ability to open the forbidden gates of the gods and make war with the hosts of heaven, as was likely Nimrod's objective in the plains of Shinar. And this leads me full circle to what I believe to be the supreme hidden purpose of the Large Hadron Collider and CERN. Recall that the Celtic deity Cernunos, the horned lord of the underworld, represents the cycle of death and rebirth, of destruction and restoration. I believe that the Luciferian priesthood behind the thrones of the European Union and the United Nations intend to use CERN as the key to literally open the gates of hell in order to release the gods that have been imprisoned there, those fallen watchers and arcane entities bound with change in the abyss of Tartarus. Their prime objective is the restoration of the Golden Age, when the gods mingled themselves with the seed of men, and their hybrid offspring ruled the earth. All of our research points, inexorably, to this grand conspiracy. It is my contention that the earth is even now being slowly terraformed via chemtrailing, harp, and other such clandestine programs in order to reconstitute the conditions that existed on the planet before the flood of Noah, in anticipation of the hybrid race that is coming. By breaking the subatomic bonds of matter and casting away the cords that hold the material world together, Mankind will willingly tear the veil that has been established for his own protection and unleash a darkness and chaos that the earth has not seen for many ages. This is the master plan of the Luciferian elite who seek to open forbidden gates and usher in the entities that will lead them in a futile war against the Lord and against his anointed. Their great hope, and that of Lucifer's, is to usurp the throne which belongs to the Son of Man and install the man of sin and of lawlessness in his place. Why do the nations rage and the people plot a vain thing? The kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed, saying, Let us break their bonds in pieces and cast away their cords from us. He who sits in the heavens shall laugh. The Lord shall hold them in derision. Then he shall speak to them in his wrath and distress them in his deep displeasure. Yet I have set my king on my holy hill of Zion.